On to Japan next. The Bank of Japan, as the Central Bank of Japan, decides and implements monet monetary policy with the aim of maintaining price stability as to achieve an inflation of 2%. However, due to a magnitude of reasons such as demographics, asset bubbles, and overly aggressive bank lending in the 80s, the country has undergone economic stagflation and resulted in what economists have dubbed as the lost decade between 1991 and 2000. However, the economic malaise has dragged on into this century, and it's now almost three decades of low growth, low inflation, and increasing bad bank debt. Nonetheless, the Bank of Japan has been quite innovative and tried many different measures, such as QE, quantitative easing, in 2001, which is known also as large-scale asset purchases. Uh, the central bank has tried to do this in order to pump liquidity into the banks. We'll go further into the mechanics of QE on the next slide. They also brought in QQE, which is quantitative and qualitative monetary easing in 2013, and QQE2 in 2014. This policy is meant to expand the monetary base by further increasing bond and other securities purchasing by the central bank, as well as increasing duration of the assets that they've bought. In 2016, after QQE and QQE2 did not have the intended effect, the Bank of Japan introduced negative interest rates in order to force banks from placing their deposits with the BOJ and compel them to lend it into the banking system to stimulate growth and inflation. And most recently, in 2018, the Bank of Japan introduced YCC, known as yield curve control, and we'll explain that in more detail a couple of slides along. Going back to QE for a moment, after the Bank of Japan introduced quantitative easing in 2001, other central banks including the Fed, the Bank of England, and the ECB all undertook similar policies during the GFC as they had cut their policy rates to effectively zero. So how is QE done? According to the Bank of England definition, Central banks can create money digitally to buy corporate and government bonds. This is known as asset pur purchase or quantitative easing, QE. In practice, if you refer back to our policy rate slides earlier, you may remember that if the central bank cuts policy rates, one of the channels that it should impact the economy is to stir up borrowing. However, after the GFC, Many central banks had already cut rates either close to or to zero, so further rate cuts would be problematic. QE was believed to be the only way to add more liquidity to the system by buying large amounts of securities from the commercial banks in order to squeeze them out of these assets and into lending money, as well as to pump liquidity directly into the system by expanding the money supply. Proponents of this conventional policy were worried that the central bank's balance sheets would become bloated with assets and could interfere in the natural operation of the capital markets. However, it was such desperate times, and in hindsight, one may argue that these coordinated efforts, such as QE, saved the global economy from falling further into recession. The latest iteration of the Bank of Japan's innovative monetary policies was Yield, Cur Yield Curve Control, or YCC. It was introduced in 2016 after the Bank of Japan felt that QE, QQE, and negative interest rates did not get inflation to the targeted 2%. Formerly called QQE with yield curve control, the Bank of Japan felt that adjustments to the front end of the curve and outright purchases of assets weren't having enough of the intended effect. Hence, they wanted to directly affect the price of the 10-year JGBs by purchasing or selling JGBs across the curve to have a bond yield of more or less at the level around 0%. The amount of purchases was to remain at about 80 trillion Japanese yen under QQE, but to target the 0% level in 10-year JGBs. The reason they wanted to have the 0% level was to shift people's deflationary mindset as a result of negative interest rates and to keep longer term interest rates from going more negative. It did have the intended effect in the short term, as you can see on the Bloomberg chart on the right hand side, 
as 10-year JGB yields did rise above 0%. However, in the medium run, the jury is still out on the efficacy of YCC, as 10-year JGB yields have slipped back into negative yield territory since then. So, now let's look at the structure of the people who have come up with these innovative policy decisions, the Bank of Japan. Policy is divided, is decided rather, by the policy board at monetary policy meetings. They meet eight times a year, and these are two-day affairs. The policy decisions that are made are made by a majority vote of the nine members of the policy board, which consists of the governor, the two deputy governors, and six under mem members. The policy decisions do not come out at a set time, but are generally released at the second day of the monetary policy uh, board meetings. So as we mentioned earlier, the inflation in Japan still remains stubbornly low and growth has been underwhelming. As the BOJ continues to grapple with this dilemma, the policy rate isn't really that useful or relevant, as their present concern is the long-term interest rate. Hence, they continue to pursue QQE with yield curve control to achieve the elusive goal of 2% inflation. Let's look at how we can use Bloomberg to help us find information on the Bank of Japan. As I showed you earlier for the Bank of England, you can just type in Bank of Japan on the top line here on a Bloomberg screen, and it'll give you suggestions as to the function. And then you can click here under the functions as I've done, or you can just type BOJ Enter, BOJ Go, if you want to go straight to the landing page. It'll give you information about the last BOJ decision, as well as the next BOJ decision that's expected on March 19th, 2020. Um, policy rates, if you click on this, it will show you the policy rates have not changed um, for quite a long time in Japan, as a matter of fact. And on this page, you'll also be able to find the CPI figures. As you know, uh, Bank of Japan has wanted to get to this 2% inflation target for quite a few number of years. And as you can see, presently inflation numbers are quite low and nowhere near that 2% target. You click through on the CPI, Bloomberg will bring you to the economic um, history, if you will, of Japan. And you can go back, in this case, to 2013 under CPI. And you'll see the only year they actually did breach that 2% target was in 2014. And that was in the... Um, uh, due to uh, Abenomics, uh, which was brought in by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2012. As you can see, the GDP numbers did see an uplift, and we did see an uptick in CPI in 2014. But unfortunately, the policy effects of Abenomics have seemed to fallen off. Now, going back to the BOJ screen, we always talk about the... Um, uh, QE, QQE, QQE with negative rates, as well as yield curve control in Japan. And you can actually see what they've done across different parts of the curve by clicking on 28 here. That gives you the BOJ asset purchases. And as you can see, this is the amount of purchases that they've bought. Um, for the example, what we're looking at here on row 12 is the Bank of Japan's government bond purchases uh, between one and three year sector. Under 13, you can see that this is from the three to five year part of the curve in JGBs, uh, Japanese government bonds, and so forth. And as you can see, they've actually started focusing purchases here in the what we call the belly of the curve from, say, the three to 10 year part of the curve, um, and have not been buying as much in the long end, which um, is called the uh, ultra-long part of the curve in Japan. 